We're in a very tough time, in fact. Uh, I'm sure most of you know uh, that you know we prayed for Krista Vinegar last week, and have been praying for her for quite a while now, and uh, she passed away last Sunday on Mother's Day, and that was uh, very sad. It was a very tough time, a very, very uh, emotional week. We had our funeral on Friday, and it's very emotional. Uh, it, it's just tough. And I think about the people that we've lost just over the last few weeks. I think of uh, Paul Casper and your family. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, think of Eugene Boyd and his dad. Think of Maggie Taylor, 22-year-old young lady, Caleb's wife that passed away. Uh, Melvin and Linda Moore's uh, grandson, his wife. Uh, and there's others that have, have passed away. I think of Krista, and it's, it's, uh, it can be very, very sad. It can be very uh, emotional. I have to say, in my ministry, I probably haven't cried more than I have in the last six or seven weeks of loss that we have experienced. And I was thinking about how it is so true that many times we can have thoughts of and actually live in depression. Because how can anything like that, anything good, come out of death? It can be very depressing. Well, we're Christians. We believe in, in what the Bible says, so we know that there is good that comes out of death. In fact, we understand that this life that we're in right now is just temporary. It's fleeting. It's just like a vapor. It's here one day and gone the next. Well, there's, as Pastor Ellery said, 28 years like Krista or 88 years or 108, it, it, it's just a quick amount of time. And I praise God that we have hope, as Joe spoke about, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the power of God in that resurrection. We have that power as well. We have that hope that when we die on this earth, that there's hope of eternal life. Hope with being with the Lord. And I believe it. I know it's true because the Bible told me so. I know that old song that we sang as kids, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Do you remember that? I believe in that book. I believe in what it says because it's living. It's just not a novel. It's not a, a fiction at all. It is truth. And is living. It is God's word to us. And he says that we can have hope even in the midst of death. I was thinking of Psalms 23, very familiar passage. And you know that part uh, that often gets, that, that passage often gets uh, spoken of in, at funerals. But it talks about in the valley of the shadow of death. I looked at shadows and shadows just doesn't stay in one spot. It goes for quite a ways, touching a lot of different things. And that's what I feel like we've been in, in the valley of the shadow of death. And it can be very depressing. In fact, when I think about depression, I think about what's the root causes of that. Why is it that we get depressed? And I often think it's because of one of two things. It's because we have a lack of something or we've lost something. We're lacking something that we feel like we need or that we should have or we've lost something that we held so dear. Sometimes we have a loss of a job or a lack of a job, lack of security, loss of security, that financial security. We have loss or we have a lack of something. We have a loss of respect from others or a lack of it. 
we have loss of relationships. Maybe you've gone through a divorce and you've still not emotionally recovered from that. Maybe you've, you're dating and you've lost that person that you're dating and they're with somebody else and it hurts a lot and you have a loss. Sometimes there are some that are single and are looking for that right man, that right woman. And you have a lack of that and you get depressed. Sometimes it is a death of a loved one. where we feel great loss and our hearts and our minds can tend to be depressed. Sometimes it's health problems. Some of you have chronic, severe health problems. There is no position that you can sit in, lay in, that you feel comfort, right? There, there's nothing that you can do that you feel good and you feel pain all the time and it leads you to be depressed. Sometimes it's unfulfilled hopes that you hope for something and hope and hope and hope for something. I know I've felt that and I know many have felt that in the last few weeks. You hope and you hope and it just, it's not going to be. And you have unfulfilled hopes and it leads to depression. Sometimes it's an uncertain future. Sometimes it's not even any of those things. There's something else. Sometimes, here's the truth, and I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but sometimes you can feel depressed, have depressive thoughts, and everything is going right. You have no idea why you're feeling that to begin with. And I've, I, like, I got a great wife. I got great kids. I got food in the refrigerator. I got a good job, all that. Why am I so miserable? I don't, I don't have anything wrong, but yet we can feel depressed. Has anybody ever felt that way when everything is going seemingly right, but yet I don't feel good, I don't feel right, I, I'm just, I'm not happy, I don't feel peace in my life? You know what? It happens to everybody. Now, a lot of people won't want to admit that, but they're is truth, I believe, in the fact that if you go through life, you'll have times that you'll be depressed. Solomon said it like this in Proverbs chapter 18, verses, uh, verse 14. He says, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? Solomon was saying that uh, when you have a wounded spirit, when your spirit is wounded and you're in depression, it's like the world, your whole world is caving in. And who can bear it? Who can bear it? There are some Old Testament examples of people who experienced depression. Hannah, you might remember her in 1 Samuel chapter 1. She cried her heart out. She poured her heart out. Year after year after year, she would go up to that feast and cry her heart out for a child. And she wouldn't have it. She couldn't have it. God, in fact, closed her womb. And she poured out her spirit. The, the preacher, the prophet, thought that she was drunk, right? And she said, I'm not drunk. I'm just pouring my spirit out before God, asking him to hear my prayer. Year after year after year, her husband's other wife would just make fun of her, taunt her, all those kind of things. Say, you don't have kids? Ha, I do. Look at my kids. They're beautiful. Oh, you don't have any? And she had to deal with that year after year after year. She was living in depression. She had depressive thoughts. There was Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 19. I love 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Because 1 Kings chapter 18 is one of the greatest victories that you would ever see in the Old Testament. And I, I don't have a lot of time, but I, I'll just try to just real quick summarize it. And it's this, that there was 450 prophets of Baal got in a competition with Elijah. And they said, let's, let's build altars, put, put uh, animals on the altars, and you cry out to your God. Don't get a match or anything like that. You cry out to your God and see if he'll send fire. And so these guys, 450 of them, are screaming, crying, 
crying out to their God. They got so desperate, they started cutting themselves, you know. And guess what? Nothing happened. Elijah said, now get barrel after barrel after barrel and pour on my sacrifice, this sacrifice. He cried out to God, called to God. Guess what? Fire came down, burn up the, the offering. It was such an amazing thing. And then Elijah, it says by himself, went and killed 450 prophets of Baal. An amazing, amazing story. I'm looking at that in the movie in my mind. I say, man, that, that dude's tough. That, that, I mean, that, I wouldn't want to mess with that guy. Aren't you glad you have nice, sensitive me? <laughs> Aren't you glad that I'm not like that? Becca, you glad? <laughs> I mean, that dude is tough. Then 19, verse, or chapter 19, one woman, Jezebel, says, if you're not dead like those prophets are by the end of the day, I'm going to take my own life. And she was saying, I'm coming to get you. And what did he do? He went and hid in a cave and sat and had a pity party and said, I want to die. I find that completely amazing. Completely, completely amazing. He had depressive thoughts. He had fear. He had worry. He had all those things. He wasn't living free at that time. But he was given over to those thoughts. Then there's David. David, you read the Psalms, the, the ones that he wrote. And you could see that this guy was oftentimes depressed, wasn't he? He, he would oftentimes be in great sorrow and great, great mourning and great fear and all these kinds of things. This was a man after God's own heart, killed Goliath. You know, he killed his 10,000, Saul killed his thousands, all of that. This was a stud of a dude. But yet he had depression that would come to him on a regular basis. And there was one event that he had depression as well. He had great sorrow. It says in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel and verse 3, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Now, I'm inferring a little bit, but you read this, that they're gonna, you're going to see they were in such great sorrow. Can you imagine what they were thinking would be happening to their kids and to their wives? What would ISIS do? Come to Southport, Indiana, burn it down, take your kids and your wives, what would they do? Horrible to even think of, right? Can you imagine the sorrow and the fear and the worry that David had? Then David, verse 4, and the people that were lifted, or that were with him, lifted up their voices and wept. And they wept so much until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever done that before? When you cry and cry hard, when you cry when you have great emotion going on, it just saps you. It takes it all out of you. It's like working an eight-hour shift, then a double, because it just takes it out of you. Can you imagine what David and all the people that, that were there, they were going through? Great, great sorrow. Great worry, great fear, great depression would come upon their life. If I could, if you could, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms chapter 42. It'll be on the screen if you don't have the Bible with you. But as I read Psalms 42, I thought of, of a person that's in depression. Read this with me. Follow along and see if you see the same thing. It says in verse 1, As the heart panteth after water, after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. What that meaning is there is a time of dryness in his life. That there is, it's, it's kind of like I'm not hearing from God. And there's great dryness and I'm thirsting after you. I want you, God. Where are you? Do you ever feel that way? 
Do you ever feel like, God, I don't know why I'm going through all this stuff. Where are you? I'm, I'm crying out to you. I'm on my knees. Sometimes we're eating carpet, so to speak, right? Uh, as a, we're just on our face before the Lord. Where are you, God? I think that's what he's saying. Is As a heart pants for the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. There's a spirit of dryness that, that we're thirsting for you. But it's a, it's a picture of, uh, where are you, God? Have you ever been through so severe of testing that you've ever thought, where are you, God? God, I'm praying, I'm crying, I'm doing all the things I should, I'm, I'm fasting even. God, where are you? Where are you at? I need you right now. It goes on and said, my soul thirsted for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with a multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh, my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites, from the hill Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I a mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me, and while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. I look at this, I've read this psalm probably a dozen times this this week, preparing for today and just dwelling in, continuing in the word. And I look at this and this is such a vivid picture of what 2016 depression can look like, especially for a believer. Because you will have great times of heartache and pain that will come into your life at times. Not always, but at times that will happen. Some of you are saying it's happening all the time. But there are some of us that at times it just happens and that great times of heartache and we get in this depression that's like, woe is me, I can't get out of it, what is going on? And it, this is such a good picture of a Christian that is in depression because it said, talks about the bad things, that tears are his food, his soul is cast down, and he feels forgotten. It even says, the enemy says, where is thy God? And when you live in depressive thoughts, you're thinking, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Most people look at a 28-year-old passing away, a 22-year-old passing away, a little baby passing away. We've had all of those funerals over the last year. And they look and they'll say, where is God in all of this? See, it's easy to have thoughts of depression, thoughts of wrong, thoughts of, of, of bad things. It's just easy, especially in this day and age. It's easy to get in those thoughts. This is a picture of a believer. It could be a picture of a believer that's in depression. Hey, this is what's going wrong in my life, but yet I know that God's there. I know that God's there. Wait a minute, but I'm still having these problems. Where are you, God? Well, wait a minute. I know that you're there. My hope's in you, God, but oh, man. Why can't I get past this? And you feel a little bipolar, right? Going back and forth. 
you know, I know God's good, but yet I'm still feeling miserable. I'm still feeling so bad. I still feel like I can't get past this. I, I, but, oh, I know God's good. Oh, but why do I feel so bad? And why do I have these problems? Why do I have this depression going on in my life? Why do I, why do I always focus on the negative? Does anybody ever do that and it's okay to admit it? That we focus on negative things so many times? I heard a pastor talking about this week, because, you know, I'm like one of those weird guys. You know what? I, I, there's a few shows I like. I like Fixer Upper. Anybody like Fixer Upper? All right. I like diners, drive-ins, and dives, right, because I like food. Obvious, right? Um, I like NFL football a lot. I mourn when it's over. Uh, but, you know, September's coming. Uh, but then I listen to preaching. I like watching preaching. I love listening to the Word of God being preached. I love it. All right? And so I'm listening to this guy, and he's, he was talking about these toxic thoughts. Craig Rochelle is his, is his name, and he's got a large church, the largest in the, in the country, and he's, he had this thing called toxic thoughts. And I thought, oh, man, that is so good. And he talked about... Any time that his wife is, is, is 20 minutes late to, to anything, he starts thinking these negative thoughts. Oh, man, she's driving. Maybe she had a wreck. Maybe she, maybe, oh, my gosh, she's dead. She, I'm going to have to do her funeral. Oh, my. And you start this mental snowball. I, have to tell, I never told Becca this. I'm telling her now. I think the same thing. And I was so relieved that there was somebody else besides me that thinks that way. We can think negative thoughts. We can think negative and it leads to depression. Because, you know, the truth is, though, there are negative things that happen. There's bad things that do happen. So there's my focus on the negative things. There's my little talk on depression I feel like we all understand that this happens and that's where we're at and we can be at doesn't mean everybody's there but we can be at that negative thoughts depression but then I was thinking I don't want to spend my whole message just talking about depression I want to talk about how God can make me free from depression so many times I think we focus on negative. Even as a pastor, I can focus on negative. And, and for me, it's trying to set up the thought, right? I'm set up the thought, yet we, we can live in depression. There's a lot of things to be depressed about, all of those kind of things. But that's not what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on living free from depression. I want to focus on living free from toxic thoughts. I want to focus on living free from negativity, negative thoughts. And you can. What did David do? If you look at verse 6 of, of that 1 Samuel passage, it says this in verse 6, And David was greatly distressed. We know that. Distressed, depressed discouraged, all of those kind of things. David was there, and I understand it. Wouldn't you be? We would. For the people spake of stoning him. They were so upset about their kids, their wives. They said, we're going to stone you. You're the leader. You took us away. You left them without us. Now our enemy has taken them. Who knows what's going to happen? And they were going to stone David. They were speaking of that because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. For some reason, didn't mention wives. I don't know why. But they were grieved for their wives as well. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's what I want to focus on because the reality is if you're an adult, you've gone through times of struggles and times of depression. You've gone through all of that. You know what that's like, don't you? 
but I want us to be encouraged that we can live free from those thoughts. I have so many different thoughts. That's why we're going to have to take all of next week to talk about this as well. It's not just my thoughts. It's what God's word says about it. Because I want to live free from negative thinking. I want to live free from depressive thoughts. I want to live free from all of that. And so here's what my only point for you today is. And we'll unpackage this a little bit more. But my only point for you today, very simple. Instead of focusing on the negative thoughts that we can tend to focus on. How am I going to make it? How am I going to get through this without her, without him? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to do all of that stuff? What about my kids? Oh, my goodness. What's going to happen with them, to them? Where, where are they going to go to school? What, what, uh, focusing on all of that brings sorrow. But if you focus on God, and again, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more at the end. If you focus on God, it's amazing how your circumstances doesn't necessarily change. They may or they may not. But your attitude toward those circumstances can change. What needs to change in me? I need to have my mind renewed on a daily basis. Right? I don't need to focus on negative stuff. I don't need to focus on the what ifs of life. What if I did that or what if I did this? I don't need to focus on that. I need to focus on God's word. And it's so freeing. I need to focus on God. What's your focus on? What are you focusing on? Are there negative thoughts that you're focusing on that just hinder you and hurt you? Are they there? I'm, I'm getting past... Uh, Oh, man, I'm going long. I'm going long. There's a lady I was speaking to. If you've been around the church for any amount of time, you know her very well. Wanda Britt. She could come forward. Where is she at? I have wanted her to tell a little bit about her story. Of how she went through a very hard, hard time in her life. And God <laughs> did some amazing things. I am so thankful for her. I've looked up to, I know she's, but I've looked up to this lady for years, years, years. Give her a hand, right? <laughs> and I, I spoke about last week at Mother's Day, you know, about the ladies in my family and I said, there's ladies in the church that have been a big impact on me. This is one of them. And uh, she has just an amazing story. I want her to share that. Well, I wanted to thank Pastor Matt for letting me come up today. And I thank the Lord for what he's done for me because it's not me, it's him. And anything that I've done today, I've done through him. Oh, you can't hear me? Is that better? Okay. I'm sorry. Anyway, thank you, Pastor Matt. And thank you, Jesus and the Lord, for what you've done for me. I just want to share a little bit with you today. Um, I, w I went to a tulip festival on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and we're going down the road on the interstate, and I see this sign, and it says, Jesus is real. And I want to tell you today, Jesus is real. He is real. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about, I don't know, a lot of you don't, some of you know, some of you don't know, my first husband died. He was 22 years old, and that was probably one of the darkest times in my life. I can remember uh, thinking, why is this happening to me? You know, why am I going through this? It's so hard, Lord. Um, but I got through it by relying on the Lord. There were times when I served the Lord. I found that that was a, a good way to get past it. I spent a lot of time in prayer. I spent a lot of time in scripture reading. And I also s spent time seeking the wisdom of older ladies here in our church. I had a lot of older ladies that supported me and helped me through this. And my, my goal was, even though I'm going through this, my first time was in the hospital for 13 months. We had a bad car accident. I came out with a scratch on my head. He came out paralyzed from mid-chest down. 
So that was quite an experience. And I'll sh if you want to know all about it, take me to get a cup of coffee, and I'll sit down and tell you what all the Lord did. But I'm just kind of touching the, the surface today because after he died, I know I went through a depression. There were times I can remember sobbing into my pillow at night. And I, I would put the pillow over. I was living back with my parents, and I'd put the pillow over my head so that nobody could hear me. And crying out to the Lord, you know, knowing I was hurting so bad. And I thought, Lord, will this ever be over? Will you, will you just help me through this and help me get through this? And, you know, one day, it just seemed like this light illuminated inside of me. That the Lord just took the pain away. Now, is it all gone? Even almost 50 years later, no, it's not gone. I still feel pain. I still find myself, December the 19th, I can be driving down the road, and all of a sudden I'll break out into tears because the hurt's still there, but I know I can turn it over to him, and I know that he's there, and I want to give him the honor and the glory for everything that he did in my life. And, yes, Jesus is real. He can re be real to you. I read a devotion not too long ago about being lifted up out of a pit, and that's what it feels like. I can't get out of it, but I know Jesus can lift me out of it. I know God's there. He's wrapping his arms around me. A lot of times in the lonely nights or lonely days, I could feel his love. I could feel him wrapping his arms around me and helping me through my daily struggles. And it was a struggle day by day, time by time. Today, do I still have dark days? Yeah, I do. I still have depression. I still have times when... I have pity parties. I still have times when the devil just kind of says, you know, you're just nothing. You're just nothing. But And I I'm, I'm really am. I'm nothing. But with God's help, I am what I am, and I want to be used by him. And I want to enjoy the good times, and I want to enjoy the, the in-between times. Uh, there's a saying that if God takes you to it, he'll lead you through it. And, yes, I want to tell you today, Jesus is real, and he will help you through Whatever you're going through, whether it's a death of a loved one, a loss, a divorce. Uh, I know I, I dealt with a lady that was going through a divorce one time, and she goes, I, I just don't know where to start. And I said, start at the beginning. Start with Jesus. You have to turn your heart over to him. And in, in Proverbs 3, 5, and I'm going to read 6, 7, and 8, it says, <clears throat> "Trust 5, 6, 7, 8, says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own lies, eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. One of the best ways I found to help my depression, again, was through prayer, reading the scriptures, but also serving, serving here in this church. I taught Sunday school. I learned so much through that. The Lord just gave me a peace, and it just overcome me. He wants to give you that peace today. Trust in him. He'll direct your paths no matter what you're going through. And remember to pray for each other as you go through each day. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wish we had. I wish we had just a long time so she could share everything. We're under the gun on time, but do you hear what she said? She was 20 years old. Husband, 13 months in the hospital. He passed away. As a 20-year-old, I think of Caleb. Too. I mean, as a 22-year-old, what do you do? You understand how depressive thoughts and sorrow and all of those kind of things are just flooding your mind all the time. What do you do? Let me say this. To the best of your ability, you need to focus on God and not the negative thoughts. You need to focus on God, not the negative thoughts. That's why I say often you need to be in the Word of God, reading it, memorizing it, meditate upon it, because that is what will sustain you. As a believer, you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Word of God, you have prayer, you have all of these things. Use them to help make you free. That pastor I told you about, talking about toxic thoughts, he gave this analogy and I really liked it. I wish it was mine, but it's his, so I'm going to... Uh, not take credit for it, but I think it's just so good. And he talked about you can either be a hummingbird or you can be a vulture. The hummingbird, so small, its wings 
beat like a million times a minute, it seems like. You don't see them much, right? They're kind of rare. Uh, I know we have them here in, in town. I've, I've seen it at my house, but you just don't see them all the time. Some of you might even have a hummingbird feeder and you might see them, but uh, I, I just don't see them often. But when you do, it's pretty amazing to look at the speed of which those, those hummingbirds are beating their wings and flying. And what they're doing is they're sticking their beak right into the, into the flower. And what they're doing is feeding on sweet stuff all the time, right? They feed on sweet stuff. And when we focus on God and read his word, it's like we're feeding on the sweetness of God through feeding on his word. And that's why it's so important I focus on God that I'm going to feed on his word. We all need to be hummingbirds for the Lord, right? Feeding on the good stuff of God. But what's a vulture do? Arms out, or not arms, wings. I'm not the brightest. I, wings out. We, we've we had some in our backyard. I mean, we live in Beach Grove, and we get these vultures, and we see them. They're flying around, and you know what they're doing? They're always looking for dead things, aren't they? So many times we can focus on the negative. It's like we're a vulture just focusing on the dead things. We need to, we need to be like a hummingbird focusing on the sweet things of life. Focusing on the word of God. You, know, you can focus on your lack of money and you can focus on it, focus on it, focus on it. And guess what? You're still miserable. Or you can focus on the good things from God's word. And guess what? Even though you might be poor, you can have peace that passeth all understanding. You can focus upon your loss. Maybe you lost someone through death, through, through just loss of a relationship. And you can focus on the, all of that and focus, focus, focus on that. And focus on the pain that comes from that. Or you can focus on the good stuff. Focus on God and focus on, hey, they were a believer. I, I think of Krista. I think of your family. I'm amazed at the good of your family. Because they have experienced the grace of God in the midst of hard times. And they have the peace of God. Are they sorry, sad, sorrow, sad? Yes. Everybody would be. Do they feel a loss? Yes. But they've chosen to focus on the sweetness of God, the goodness of God, not the negative of their loss. Focus on the good things of God, and you'll have peace that passeth all understanding. Focusing on God. Sometimes we can just focus on the negative. But I'm telling you what, if you switch this around and say, I'm going to focus on God, I'm going to be a hummingbird, not a vulture. I'm going to focus on that stuff that is good. You'll be amazed how those negative thoughts, even though they might come up every day, how you can defeat those and live free from depression by focusing on God. Focus on God. Be a hummingbird, right? Don't be a vulture. Focus on God. Let's pray. As the worship team comes up, Father, we're just asking.